sort of out there in the literature, the idea that uh, men are more likely to just put themselves forward. I think what's really interesting is that people often say, well, that's a problem with women, right? Women not putting themselves forward. But actually another way you could see that is that it's a problem with men. Men are putting themselves forward when actually they're not qualified and sort of talking their way through something. So I guess partly you could say, well, should women be doing that? Or should men only be putting themselves forward when actually they're qualified? So it is interesting because a lot of the work is about making women more confident and making them you know, more likely to put themselves forward. But actually, if I put myself on the side of someone who's hiring, I actually want people to apply who are actually qualified for the job. For me, when I look at two CVs, I don't just want to take them on face value as if they're equal, because actually I know society's not equal. So if you have one person that perhaps isn't quite as pushy, and you can see that that person's a woman, maybe you can take that into account. So I'm not saying that we should hire unqualified women, but I think it's not quite so simple as that. And I think unless we have a society that is not gendered, I think if we take the names off um, CVs, then that's not the same thing as equality. There's a lot of work done on women's, say, leadership training and, and special courses for women. And on the one hand, I find them quite empowering and, and I like them because they acknowledge that women face different barriers. Um, where I worry about them a little bit is when, if they ever come across as trying to fix women, as if there's something wrong with women. So you don't know how to lead, so we'll teach you how to lead properly. Or you're not uh, pushy enough, so we'll teach you to be more pushy. Um, I think there's often a lot of that about trying to teach women to be more like stereotypical men. I'm not saying all men are like that, but our stereotypes are what are men are like. And I'm not sure that's the solution. So I think a lot of the solution is trying to fix so the societal sort of status quo. I think some of it might be about fixing men, in, you know, in, in that men need to be fixed as much as women need to be fixed. I think we're all implicated in these things together. But I do think knowing that women face additional barriers, I think women knowing about those barriers and perhaps given, being given tips about how you might respond to those barriers is useful, as long as it's not about fixing women to make them more like men. Glass Cliff doesn't look at science in particular but it certainly looks at gender inequality more generally and it looks at the types of positions that women might take on when they do take on leadership positions so if they do break through the glass ceiling um, and one of the things that we found is that women tend to take on leadership roles or occupy leadership roles in times of crisis so when things are difficult when things are um, risky then women are more likely to take on leadership roles and that sort of means that their leadership roles are going to be kind of precarious the chance of failure is, is much higher some of the stuff that we've looked at particularly is looking at role models and the lack of role models and, and research that we've done here at the university but also more broadly suggests that where people don't have appropriate role models um, then they're less likely to have ambitions to have a career in that area. Um, but I think really importantly we've looked at the types of role models they are and, and sort of what makes an effective role model. So one of the things that we've looked at is that you don't, you know, so if you want more women in science it's not just about saying look here's three or four women in science they're really successful. One of the things that you need to do is make sure that they're attainable so that people can feel like they can be like them, that they're desirable, that they want to be like them, and that they sort of embody the same sorts of goals that you want to achieve. Um, so, and all of those things are really important. And I think when you start to narrow it down like that, um, just a single successful female woman might not actually be an appropriate role model for everybody. You know, they might inspire some, but they may not inspire others. Everyone's gonna have a different role model that inspires them. And I think actually in some cases, an, a given individual might need to look to three or four different role models. So they might need to look at someone as a scientist, and then someone as a supervisor, and then someone who's got a good work-life balance, and someone who's got a good moral compass, for example. So I think the idea that there would just be one brilliant role model that will suit all needs is, is unlikely to be the case. So you may need to look to lots of different people. Um, and I think the other thing that I think is really important is that 
you know, role models need to be accessible. So it's not always taking the most senior woman in a particular field and and asking her to be a role model for everyone. Partly because that's a lot of hard work for her. I mean, especially, you know, when she's likely to be very busy because she's the only woman, you know, in, in that field. Um, but also, I think we can often be inspired by people not just at the top, but who are one stage ahead of us. It's important not just to show the most senior women, because these are women that maybe have come through a number of years before where it was harder to do it when you had children. Whereas actually you might see some really strong postdocs or some really strong senior lecturers that are, are balancing family and career at the same time. We did some work with the Royal College of Surgeons where one of the things that we developed for exactly these sorts of reasons um, was a vodcast where we had, it was 17 minutes long, had about 20 different role models um, that female surgeons could relate to, but some of were men, some were women, some had children, some didn't, some were really warm and touchy-feely, both men and women, and some were a bit harder, and it was just them talking about their experience and some of the barriers and those sort of things, and again, what came out by the end of it was the message that all types of people have made it in surgery. So there are really warm, fuzzy, parental men, and there are also some quite hard lines, you know, very career oriented women, and then everything in between that as well. So I think it is having that range. And so that video, for example, is shown to medical students and it's shown to surgical trainees, and it's up on the Royal College of Surgeons website so that people who are thinking about surgery can see that as well. The message that you want to get across is all sorts of people have been successful in science. Not just, look, this woman's been successful in science, isn't she great? Um, you really want to say anyone can be successful. I mean, not anyone, you've got to work hard, but all sorts of people have been successful. And I think that, that really requires a whole range of role models. And that's not just based on gender, it might be based on sexuality or race or class or ethnicity or all of those things. So we need to be able to relate on all of those dimensions.